um, another 2 2 creature. Traditionally speaking, they would attack each other, they both die, they both go away in a story. What First Strike says is, my 2 damage from Sun Home Stalwart will actually do 2 damage to your creature first. So if that's the case, your 2 2 dies, it does not get to do damage back to me. So First Strike it can be beneficial in that case. I mean, if you're still attacking a. Yeah, three. If, if you're attacking with a 2 2 First Strike and they block with a 3 3. You still die, because you do two damage to it, it still has one left, and it does three damage back to you, once it finally gets to resolve, and it kills it. So. Lava Coil, four damage to target creature. If that creature would die this turn, exile instead. So again, it says dying and going to the graveyard, it dies and goes in exile. Very, very powerful against decks that go into the graveyard for stuff. Sure Strike, target creature gets plus three, plus zero, and first strike to end a turn. There's three copies of those. Very good when you think you have when they think you just have a one one out there to block and they have a let's say a four four. You play this sucker when you go to block, it now becomes a four one with first strike and kills their creature with your still living. Forest Challenger, another mentor card, another plus one plus one to end a turn. Just a strike. Target creature just deals damage to itself equal to its power. So obviously you use this against one of their creatures. Great against big beefy creatures you want to get out of the way. Great against creatures that have a stronger toughness rather than a... Um, sorry, a stronger power rather than toughness. Have one copy of that. Legion Guild Mage. Just a 2-2 two, two for 2. Nothing special there. However, let's look at its abilities. 5 and a red and tap it. It deals 3 damage to each opponent. Let's talk about each opponent for just a second. We can't do it currently in Magic the Gathering Arena. But you can in Magic the Gathering Online, and it's, a, and it's done in paper form, especially in um, very casual settings. You can play a 2v2 instead of 1v1, and each opponent would count towards both opponents. So, Or you do you know, what's, what's a, a free-for-all type thing where you get four or five players and you get to choose who attack each turn. So it's it's... It can be very fun, so each opponent is it's very key phrase there. I need to drink real quick. Alright. So, we have um, two Legion Guild Mages. Oh, the second half of that is two and a white and tapped another target creature. We've already seen how that works. Um, traditionally, you would do that to get one of their beefy blockers out of the way, yes you lose the guild mage for attacking, but if they have a 5-5 five, five out there, um, you may do that just so you can attack with something else going through and doesn't get blocked. <clears throat> Two copies. Now the dual card, response, deals 5 damage to a atta target attacking or blocking creature. Let's stop there. When attacks are done, okay, there is a spot in there that you can respond to the attack before you assign your blockers. You even have a chance to respond to a blocking creature before damage is dealt. So there are a couple of phases, if you will, within the attack phase. So as response, if they are attacking with a creature, let's say a 4-4, a four, four, and all he has a 1-1 one, one to block, as soon as they get to attack and tap their creature to attack, in response to that, you can cast aptly named response and deal 5 damage to that attacking creature. Same thing on the back end. If... You have a 3-3 three, three creature out there, and they have a 2-2 two, two they block with, and then let's say they use the, um, oh, what was it called? Infuriate, which gives a plus 2, plus, a plus 3, plus 2. Now it's a 5-4, it's going to kill your guy. You can cast this in response to them blocking, which kills them. Now, while we're on the topic, are you following so far? If you got 2-2 two, two that was attacking, sorry, 3-3 three, three that was attacking, that 2-2 blocking, that's now a 5-4. So your guy's dead outright. They don't die. You cast the 5 damage to target the blocking creature. They now die, your guy lives. However, in the world of magic, just because you killed it, a blocker was still assigned to your attacking creature. Therefore, the damage does not go through. Okay. So they had a 3-3. Three, three. Now you have a 3-3. Three, three. They had a 2-2 two, two blocking it. It became a 5-4. You killed it with response. Now you have a 3-3. It looks like it's attacking. Not looks like it's being blocked by nothing. So it should go through. 
they had already signed a blocker to a, a valid blocker so that the damage does not go through the caveat to that is if that if your through three has trample that would still go through for all three damage but i know nuance rewind back for another 15 20 seconds replay it again um if you have questions again reach out to me if you have questions now put it in the chat i can walk back through it for you so that's response that's how you'd use it resurgence Here's another keyword that we haven't seen yet. This is a sorcery, though, so this has to be used on your turn during one of your main phases. Creatures you control gain first strike and vigilance till end of turn. Okay, so we talked about first strike, so that means they get to attack without, you know, you know, first before they get the damage belt back to them. Vigilance is a new one, so generally speaking, when you attack, a creature taps, right? And then you can't block with it. Vigilance says an attacking creature does not cause a creature with vigilance to tap. So if I were to attack with a, you know, my healer's hawk, traditionally would turn, you know, we tap it to attack with it, but it doesn't have to tap now. So I can use it as a blocker on, on their turn. It's also, that, that's a very neat um, ability to have. After this main phase, there's an additional combat phase followed by an additional main phase. All right, so traditional play. You got the upkeep and draw. You got your first main. You've got your combat. You got your second main. And then you're done. You're in step. What this says is, as after this main phase, there's additional comma phase followed by additional main phase. Okay, so let's say what you've what you've basically done is created a upkeep and draw, main, combat, second main, combat, third main. Is what you've done. Why is that a big deal? Well, let's think of it this way. You've got first strike. They've got blockers who would normally have blocked and either killed your guys or it would be a trade, what have you. So you've given first strike and vigilance. Okay. So you attack with your creatures. They now don't tap. Okay. They don't tap when you attack with them. And now with the first strike, you start killing a bunch of their creatures off. Okay. You now have a second attack phase. So not only did your creatures not tap, so they can attack again. But they also have first strike again. So if there's anything left over, they can attack it again. That's why that's such a huge card. So you get one copy of that. Swift Blade Vindicator, double strike, vigilance and trample. It's a one one for two. Let's talk about double strike. Double strike does first strike damage and then regular combat damage. So let's say this is a one one with double strike and vigilance and trample. It gets blocked by a one one. The first strike damage goes off. It kills the 1-1. One, one. Okay? Done. First strike kills 1-1 one, one blocking it. Double strike says it would attack again for regular combat damage. So now it actually gets strikes the player. Vigilance means it doesn't tap, and trample means any extra damage would go through. So if you buff the sucker up with... Um, let's say it's good mentor. Okay, that's a good one actually, because it's a three-one. If you bump it up, this now becomes a two-two with double strike of vigilance and trample. So let's say it's blocked by a one-one next time. Okay, it's a two-two now because it has a counter on it. It will now deal two damage to the one-one blocking it as first strike. The one extra damage since it's being blocked by one-one would go to the player. And then the double strike triggers mean additional attack of 2-2 goes to his player. So you've not done 3 damage with a 2-2 card. You have one copy of that. Again, this is, all comes in one of the starter decks. Okay. 2 Rock Chargers. This is just a 1-3 flying for 2 and a white. Whenever Rock Charger attacks, target attacking creature without flying gains flying until in a turn. That's also very good in case you have a lot of big beefy ground blockers such as against a green deck. This will give one of your targeting uh, attacking creatures flying to go over top of them such as this guy or this guy you know normally two three okay he gets blocked that sucks if he has flying unless they have a flying creature with reach can't be touched two of those sworn companions let's talk about tokens all right so sworn companions is a sorcery meaning you have to play it during one of your main phases create two one one white soldier creature tokens with lifelink all right, so tokens. Tokens are, as you see on the screen, is just a very basic 
nondescript card. This one's a 1-1 one, one with lifelink. What makes tokens interesting is they aren't a traditional creature in the fact that if they're removed from battlefield, they are destroyed. Okay? So when a regular creature is sent to the graveyard, there are abilities and, and, sp and spells and what have you, and interactions that allow you to pull it back out of the graveyard. There are ability, there are spells and stuff which causes the card to go back into your hand. Okay? Either of those cases removed from the battlefield. If it is a token, it is just flat out destroyed. So a card like Unsummon, which is a which is a, a blue card. Um, let's look at this real quick. Unsummon, return target creature to its owner's hand. Alright. If it's a token, that now becomes a, a destroyed target token for one blue. So, that's how tokens work. Lifelink. Alright, so deal damage dealt by a creature, planeswalker, or spell with lifelink also causes the controller to gain that much life. It does not have to attack for that much damage. That's very important to remember. So, if you have, um, where was that? Justice Strike? Yeah. Justice Strike deals damage to itself equal to its power. So, this is dealing damage, not attacking. So if I were to actually cast that on my own token, I don't know why in the hell you would do that. Um, but just for, just for sake of argument, because it does damage, it's still going to do one damage and I get one life because of lifelink. That's a sore free. They do come out with summoning sickness. So you won't be able to attack with those tokens that turn, but they are available to block. Two copies. Act of Treason. Another sorcery spell, two and a red. Gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature. It gains haste until end of turn. Lots of stuff to cover here, okay? Gain control of target creature until end of turn. This is traditionally used to take one of their creatures. Okay? Alright. Untap that creature. So if you just took control of the creature and it was tapped... It doesn't really provide you any benefit. You can't attack with it. You can't block with it. It doesn't provide you any benefit. But now you can untap it. So now it becomes either a blocker or a attacker. Let's think for a minute. If it's your turn, it has to be your turn because it's a sorcery spell, and it's gain control until end of turn, you're not going to take it to block with because end of turn it goes back to the owner. So you're using this to attack. All right. It gains haste until end of turn. What does haste do? A creature with haste can attack and tap as soon as it comes under your control. All right. So let's say they had just played a big beefy 6-6 six, six on their turn. It has summoning sickness until the start or the following turn. If you use this on your turn, your next turn that comes up, if it didn't have it gains haste, you would be taking control of a creature that still has summoning sickness. So again, we have come to the conclusion that you're using this to only attack because you can't use it to defend. But if it has summoning sickness, you can't attack with it. Giving it haste will allow it to actually attack as well. So that's that that can be a very very cheeky card at times. Um, you have one copy of that in the stack. Legion War Boss Mentor. 2-2 two, two for Tuna Red. Not that big of a card at this point in time, but let's see what else it does. At the beginning of combat on your turn, beginning of combat, okay? We haven't even declared attackers yet. Combat phase had just started. Create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token, as you can see on the screen. That token gains haste, so not only is it created, but it doesn't come in with summoning sickness. Cool, we can attack right now. Haste until end of turn. And attacks this combat if able. Alright, so it comes in, it has haste, and it has to attack. Alright. So good, so, so far so good. But Mentor on top of it. So Legion Warboss is a 2-2. Everything he's creating is 1-1. One, one. So what Mentor says is whenever this creature attacks, put a 1-1 one, one counter. So let's walk through how this will play out. You're going to play this in your first main phase. Okay. Traditionally speaking, you don't play creatures till second main phase because you don't want to give up to your opponent 
what your mana is being used for during attack phase. It can't attack anyway, so it doesn't do you any good to put it in the first main phase, unless it has haste. Um, so, But we're going to play this in the first main, because as soon as it hits the battlefield, anything on it becomes in effect. So if it hits the battlefield in the first main phase, the next phase is combat. You immediately get to create that 1-1 creature token. Now, he, the Legion War Boss can't attack, so Mentor doesn't come into play, but you have a 1-1 creature token attacking. The following turn, when Legion War Boss can attack, he'll create a second 1-1 creature token, and now he gets to put a a, uh, a plus 1 plus 1 counter on any one of the 1-1s he's already made. So that's, that's why it's a, a big card. Let's pause for just a moment. You get one copy of this, but let's pause for just a second. One thing I didn't cover, and this is my fault, should have covered this during the, um, we'll talk about what's actually on the card. There's a symbol um, to the f to the right of what type of card it is. So we see Creature, Goblin, Soldier, and there's a symbol. That symbol refers to what set this card came out of. So if we go to here, each set has a different symbol lets you know which symbol it came out of. Okay. Standard means of the last core, the last six um, sets, those are available to be played unless you're in historic mode. Okay. We'll talk about that later. So this was came from Guild of Ravnica. So if we go back, Guild of Ravnica is what set Legion War Boss came out in. So if you are looking to buy packs of cards, or maybe one packs of cards, you aren't going to find him in just any pack. He's only going to be in packs that are from Guilds of Ravnica. Okay. Second, each of these symbols have a color. Either it can be just plain black with white outline. It can be silver with black outline. It can be gold with black outline. Or it can be orange with black outline. Okay. Let's talk about those mean. Black with white outline means it's what we call a common card. It's going to be very basic. It's not going to have very much flash to it, very much pizzazz. Not, you know, not going to really turn a game around. Um, it's a common card. So, again, this is a two and a white, and you get two white one soldiers out of it. Okay, not that big of a deal. But also because they're common, they are very frequent when you get new packs of cards. So... In a pack of cards in Magic the Gathering Arena, you get eight cards in a pack. Five of those are going to be common cards. So five out of every eight. So 62.5% of the time, you're going to get a common card. So that's 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 what that comes down to. Your silver ones are what we call uncommons. Okay. So they're a little bit flashier. Um, like this is just a one one, I'm sorry, one three for three. That's not that big of a deal, but it's got flying, a little bit better. But also when he attacks, another targeting attacking creature gets flying too. Just a little bit more beef to it. Um, uncommons obviously are more frequent than commons. In an eight card pack from Magic Gathering Arena, you're going to get five commons and two uncommons guaranteed. So 25% of the cards you get in a pack are going to be uncommons. All right, so we talk about seven of the eight. Go to Legion War Boss, who we just talked about. Okay, that is a rare card. That's what that gold symbol means. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how cool this card is. It's a two-two for three. Not that big of a deal. Mentor now makes it probably uncommon at this point in time. But this crate, you know, this token, you know, each turn with haste, it now makes it a much beefier card. Okay, so that's why it's a rare. All right, we'll get to the orange one in just a second when we get down to Aurelia, but rares, well, just let's let's pause in there, okay? Let's go to Skydant Legionnaire. He's a common creature, 2-2 two, two for 3, but he has flying and haste, so this makes him a pretty um, beefy card in terms of commons go, because I just, as I just said, a 2-2 two, two for 3 is traditionally just a basic common, um, but he has flying, and he has haste. So not only can he not be blocked by anything with flying reach, but he comes in can attack as soon as he comes in. So on turn three, because you don't have three mana down, he can come out and start beating somebody in the face. Pretty solid. You get two copies of those. Tajik Legion's Edge. All right. A th three cost legendary creature. It's a three two rare. All right, so let's break this one down. We already talked about legendaries. So legendaries, again, 
you can't have more than one card with the same name on the battlefield if it's a legendary, okay? So if we had four, which we only have one in this deck, we had four of these, if I had a Tajik Legion's Edge on the battlefield, and I tried to play a second one, they both would be destroyed. Actually, let me caveat that real quick. I think they changed the rules on that a couple years ago, and I think it is you just lose the one that comes in. It's called the Legend Rule. Okay, yes, yeah, so back in uh, 2014, because that's what I was playing last time, I remember when it actually came in. Um, if you were to play a second Tajik, you get to choose which one stays. The other one would go to the graveyard. It's not destroyed. It's not, let's see what this says, it's not destroyed, it's not sacrificed. It can't be prevented from being instructable. Um, and the reason why it's important because you have certain abilities that trigger on cards being destroyed, cards being sacrificed. So it's just removed and put to the graveyard. Okay, wording is everything in this game. All right, so back to Tajik. Legendary creature, Haste. Can come in and attack as soon as under control. We just talked about that with Sky Knight Legionnaire and the Legion War Boss. Has Mentor, so immediately can come in and attack. And anything that has less than three power, you can give it a plus one, plus one counter. It has First Strike. If you pay a red and a white. Wow, okay. But I've skipped over one. Prevent all non-combat damage that would be dealt to other creatures you control. Non-combat damage. Remember that red deck we just played against? It had shock in there, it was deals two damage to the target. It had um Chandra's Pyromancer Pyrom was it Chandra's oh this is killing me here. I should know this. Pyro Helix, that's what it was. Two damage divided among a one or two targets. Another one. Shana's Outrage, four damage to target creature and two damage to that creature controller. Okay. What Tajik says is all non-combat damage is prevented to other creatures. Now, they can still die to combat, can get damage based on combat, but they can't take a shock or a lava coil. Talked about up here. They can't take one of those. That prevents it. I mean, the player can still cast it. It'd be silly of them to do so because all it does is send that card right to the graveyard. It's a waste of waste of a play. That's what makes this a rare card. It gains first strike. So if you had five mana here, two reds, two whites, and just a fifth one, he comes in with haste, prevents all non combat damage, has mentor, and he has first strike. Pretty impressive. One copy of that one. Dagger Sail Aranaut. Okay, two copies. It's a common. Just a 3-2 for 4. As long as it's my turn, it's got flying. Okay, so as, as it's my turn, and he attacks, he has flying. If it's hit their turn, and he's blocking, he doesn't have flying. So that's pretty... That's just as common. It's not that flashy. Tectonic Rift. Sorcery. Can only play on your turn. Destroy target land. Creatures without flying can't block this turn. Destroy target land is it's it's not as useful as it once was in previous um, sets, but I could see this in some of the you know you know mythics and, and rare lands. This could be beneficial, I guess. Um, targets creatures that flying can't block this turn. If you're playing against a green deck, this could be helpful. Um, we don't have a lot of flyers out there playing against a black deck with a lot of death touch. Um, could help you get some attacks through. That's a common as well. You get one copy of that. All right, Aurelia. So this is the orange symbol. That's what we call mythic rare. So we had the rare symbol, which is gold. We have the mythic rare on Aurelia. So we talked about five commons in a pack, two uncommons. The eighth card is either a rare or a mythic rare. Okay, you have a... I think it's a one in... Ooh, I don't want to misquote this. I think it's one in 28. Okay, one in eight, sorry. Rares you get, and so that, okay, let's, let's change that back. Five commons, two uncommons, that last card is a rare. 
one out of eight times that rare is a mythic rare. Okay? Alright, so that's that. Back to Aurelia. Why is she a mythic rare? Alright, so she's a 2-5 legendary creature. Alright, so legendary can have more than one copy on the battlefield at the same time. Has flying. Okay, we're getting there. Good stuff. Mentor. Even solid. At the beginning of combat, again, beginning of combat. Doesn't have to attack, just beginning of combat. Go, think back to the Legion War boss. Begin of combat. So right off the bat, 1-1 one, one comes out. So right off the bat, begin of combat, choose up to one target creature you control. Can choose up to. Means you don't have to choose one. Choose up to one target control. Until end of turn, that creature gets plus two, plus zero. Period. Alright, so it doesn't matter what creature it is, it's plus two, plus zero. It gains trample. If it's red. Okay, we're talking about trample. It's damage. If it surpasses the the toughness of the card blocking it, it, whatever the excess is goes through to the player. If it's white, it gains vigilance, which we said it doesn't tap to attack. So let's think of how this plays through. Now we can start talking about the, the synergies of this deck. So let's see. You have some cards out there. Aurelia comes out. Right off the bat, combat hits. Okay. So you can give plus two, plus zero to anybody. Let's look at... Skynet Legionnaire. It's now a 4-2 with flying. Alright. That's solid. Alright. But, as I said, the color of the card is depicted by what color of mana you have to use to play it. So this is a white card because it costs white mana. This is a red card because it costs red mana. These are red and white cards because they cost both. So in the case of Skylight, Sky Knight Legionnaire, if you select Sky Knight, it gets the plus 2, plus 0. It gets trampled because it's red. It also gets vigilance because it's also white. So you now have a 4-2 trample flyer with haste and vigilance. That's massive. Massive. All right. Even more so. Let's, let's take this a step further. Tajik. All right. Aurelia is on the board, or you just played her either way. All right, Tajik gets plus two, plus zero. All right, so that's a five, two. Give it first strike. All right, so it's time to go to five damage to somebody before it even gets touched. Mentor is the key word here. Because now anything with less than five that's attacking, which, if I'm not mistaken, everything in here is five, well, except for light, we'll get to that in a second. Everything else is less than five power. Tajik can now put a counter on that creature. Just because Arroyo's on the board. Okay. So because of the buff occurred before the attacking phase. Alright, so combat starts. Plus two, plus zero hits. The next thing is the attack portion of the phase, which now they are attacking. So when this creature attacks, it looks at its power then and assesses everyone else's power. So now it's 5-2. Go to attack. You choose it to attack, now Mentor triggers. Anything less with less than 5 attack can now be put a plus 1, plus 1 counter. And because it goes during the attack phase, that plus 1, plus 1 counter occurs before damage is dealt. Now you're starting to see some synergies here. How Mentor works, how First Strike works, how it really helps, helps out, how Legion Warboss helps out. Now you're starting to see how that all works. Now you're seeing why she's the Mythic, because all the stuff she can create. That's the synergies I'm talking about and how when you're looking at a deck and figure out how to play it, I'm playing this by revolving my stuff around the mentor keyword. Mentor keyword and doing some damage to the face. Lava coils, you know, just some, doing some uh, active treasons, that sort of thing. So, True Fire Captain, another mentor card. Two reds and two whites. So you have to have two of each. You can't have three red and one white. That sort of thing. Two of each. It's a four-three, which is pretty good. But it has a mentor. Whenever two fire captain is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target player. All right, let's talk about what they call chump blocking. Um, chump blocking is well, it's really done by a very weak creature like a one-one or two-two. But what happens is if you're faced with a situation where you have to sacrifice one of your own cards not to take shots to the face. All right, so they have a big 7-7 seven, seven creature who he was attacking and he's doing 7 damage to you each time. Remember, you both traditionally only have 20 health. 
you've got to block. It doesn't have trample, so if you block with anything, the damage doesn't go through. So chump blocking will be saying, taking this um, goblin banneret and saying, you've got a 7-7, seven, seven, I'm going to block with this 1-1. One, one. Sure, my 1-1 one, one dies, but I'm not, I'm not taking any of that 7 damage to the face. Okay, follow so far. Now, let's go too far, Captain. That damage is still dealt, regardless of what the damage is. So if you're blocking a 7-7 seven, seven with True Fire Captain, yes, True Fire Captain dies. However, it deals that much player to damage to target players. So now that 7 damage is dealt to it, I can now bounce back to the player that just attacked me. Get that? It deals that much damage when it's dealt damage. All right. If it gets hit by... Um, what was that... Uh, was it called? Or was it the oh, storm? Command the storm. Five damage target creature. Boom. They use that against True Fire Captain. They're taking five to the face too. All right, makes sense. Light fire. I'm oh, sorry. Light of the Legion. Five five for six is not stellar at all. Why is it rare? Flying. Okay, cool. Mentor. It already is a five five. So everything here is fair game if it's attacking and so is light leader to get a plus one plus one counter on it everything perception anything you buffed with really if you already did or anything already has um counters on it so if you already gave true fire captain a counter last turn because only had four it's now a five four you can't give it to it again because it had the same amount of power all right so that's still a big deal flying mentor five five for six not that bad of a deal. When Light of Legion dies, put a plus one, plus one counter on each white creature you control. Each. True Fire Captain. It's white. Aurelia. White. Tajik. White. Sky Knight. White. Your tokens are still white. Ruck Charger. White. Vindicator. Legion Guild Mage. Boris Challenger. Stalwart. Healer's Hawk. The only ones that would not get the counter would be Goblin Banneret because it's a full red um, creature. Legion War Boss and your Argonaut would be the only ones that would not get counters. That's, a, that's pretty stellar. Alright, so we've now gone over all of our cards in our deck. Oh, but, 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 but wait, what you got coming down here. Alright, so you got your lands. I said you have your low cost, high cost, and your lands. Plains and Mountains, yes, I have the fancy ones. Doesn't matter for the fancy. Again, this doesn't matter for fancy. The, the, the wording on is the same thing as the basic one. It's just because yeah, I like shiny. Some people collect those. Um, Plains and Mountains, so we have 10 of each. Um, traditionally speaking, you're going to look at the makeup of your deck and figure out how much of, of your 24 lands, or up around about 24, you would have so you can cost so you can cast your spells. So the way to do that, well, the way, way we used to do that in paper form, is you literally take all 36 of your cards and you count how many specific will be called dots on each of the cards. So this would have two white dots. This would have two white dots and two red dots, but there's two copies. So now we're up to six white and four red, so on so forth, and then figure out the um, composition or the, the probability the proportion, that's the word I'm looking for proportion of red spells versus white spells okay, and then you do the same thing apply that proportion to your lands so if it was um, let's take a nice round number um, let's go two for one alright, so we had twice as many white dots as we did red dots I would need to have twice as many planes as I would had mountains so I would do 16 planes in red and eight mountains. That makes sense. So, luckily, you don't have to do that. Luckily, in Magic Arena, they have a suggest lands button, and it will do all of that for you. Okay. So, that's a very fun, um, car, a very fun uh, ability to use here. Now, let's talk about multicolor lands okay this will throw a wrench in this so we knew we'd have 20 you know if we go here 
it's a few more red than white because it, it actually counts it up for you. 77, 60, okay, anyway. It will do the probability for you. It would have been 12 and 12 here, or 13 and 12 if there's 25 lands. Let's talk about dual color, dual color lands, okay? All right, so most lands give you one source of mana, either red or white in this case, all right? But now we have, um, I've said, give me anything that is red or white. Okay, this means they're dual colored, okay? So I have Boros Guildgate in here. Enters the battlefield tapped. Now, as you saw when we played the game, your land comes in untapped, you can use it immediately. Boros Guildgate does not. It comes in tapped, so you cannot use it that turn. However, the next turn, once it untaps, you can tap it for either red mana or white mana. So, why is that a big deal? Well, now you have one card that is taking the place of two cards-ish. Not really. Why is that big of a big deal? That's a yawn. Sorry, I apologize. Let's say you are dealt a hand. Or let's just go this way. A lot of these cards require both a red or a white. Okay? And let's say you have a lot of red cards in your starting hand. But you have... Yeah, Rock Charger. Like, well, crap. I don't have a plane, so I can't play this anytime soon. Unless I draw planes. Well, if one of those mountains or one of those red sources of mana you have is actually Guildgate, you can tap that for white mana and play Rock Charger. Or you can tap the next turn for red mana and play War Boss. Either or. But because it's a common card, it's like, okay, you get two different sources of mana. So that's kind of better than us basic land, but it's going to come in tapped. Okay. You get four of those in the set, in this deck. Sacred Foundry. This is a rare. It says Mountain and Plains. The other one said Gate. Let's talk, we'll talk about that in a minute. Mountain and Plains. Enters the battle. As it enters the battlefield, you may pay two life. Oh, why the hell would you want to pay two life? That's kind of you know, crappy. Well, if you don't, it enters it tapped. Okay. So if you don't pay two life, it is no better for you than a guild gate. Enters tapped. Gives you red and a white. No big deal. If you pay two life, it comes in untapped, so you can play that, you can use that mana immediately. So let's say you're kind of, you know, you're under the gun, you know, you're getting pressure a little bit, and you're like, God, if I just, if I could play something, if I had white mana, I could play this and I'd be set to go, so on and so forth. Well, if you draw a Sacred Foundry, you may sacrifice that two life just so you can get that card that you need the white mana for out. That turn. That's why you'd use that. That's why it's a rare. It's also a rare because... It says it is a mountain or a plains on the card, whereas this is a gate. There are certain cards out there that allow you to go take a certain... Go search your library and take a mountain out and put it on the battlefield untapped. This is a mountain. This is not, even though it gives red mana. This says mountain on the card. You know, such and such as power is equal to the number of planes you have on the battlefield. This is a plains. This is not. Certain things says power is equal to the number of gates you have. This is a gate. This is not. Okay, that's that's the big difference. Yes, they both provide red or white mana, but the type of it is what will discern it between uh, different types of cards. Now you say, hey, what's the third one on your screen? That's kind of nifty. That's not in our deck. Um, I'll go over it anyway. Enters it tapped. We'll talk about cycling different different episode, but it allows you to have it comes in tapped, but you get a red, a black, or a white. So it gives you three different sources of mana. So um, that's that. So now that we have four guild gates in here and one sacred foundry, we're like we don't need that many mountains or plains now because that takes care of both. So I will usually take if for every dual land I have, I'll take out two of each, or take out one of each from from here. So we're down to ten plains and ten mountains. Uh, four guild gates and one foundry. That is your deck. Lots of information. Um, again, if you have questions, please reach out and chat. Let me know. Um, hit me up after the fact on Instagram, on Twitter, um, Facebook even. And 
I can answer those questions for you. If not, I can get the answer for you. So, where does that put us now? And let, let me let's do this real quick, actually. Figure. Okay, a little better. I realize when I'm actually leaning forward playing, you can hardly see my face. So. Yeah, let's do that. Maybe it's better. We have audio problems, we have video problems. Yeah, whatever. Um, so yeah, that is our deck. Um, all right. So let's take another few minute break here. Get up, stretch your legs, use the restroom if you need to. When we come back, I'm going to talk about uh, Magic the Gathering Arena. Um, now that we've you know, gone through how to play, how to, you know, what a deck composition looks like, let's talk about what Magic the Gathering Arena has to offer. Why you can hop in today, not spend a dime, get set up, ready to go get to playing and, and what you can do with that. So I know I've talked about it in a previous video, but I'm going to go back over it again for you if you're joining us for the first time because you're new to Magic. All of this will make more sense to you now, uh, now that we've talked about this. And then um, I might get some matches here. So again, um, let's take a break and we'll be back in just a few moments.
All right, and we're back. So we covered how to play. Basics, the fundamentals, going through the turns, playing your mana, playing your creatures, smack them in the face, winning the games. Talked about how a deck is made up. So we walked over through synergies, we walked through mana costs, we walked through um, land composition, that sort of thing. So what do we do now? You know, how do I how do I get started? How do you get started? So this is all cool. I'm excited. You you know, Rexel, I appreciate it. You showed me how this all works. You know, seems like a lot of fun. How do me and my buddies get started with this? Well, let's show you how. So first, you're going to go to um, Magic the Gathering Arena's website. You're going to download a um, you download a client just like you would many of the other games out there. Um, this is not I mean not done through Steam. I don't think it's done through Steam. I know mine isn't. Um, hmm, good question. I don't think... No, it's not done through Steam. Okay. Um, I just gathering duels, which is totally thing, different thing altogether. Else, but this is not done through Steam, so it's a standalone client. You'll create yourself a Wizards account if you didn't already have one. Now, for those of you who played the Paper Magic game, you may already have an account. If you set up an account to go look at your DCI points and stuff like that, you have an account. So you can use that same account. If you don't, if you're like, what the hell are you talking about, Rex? Well, what's DCI and, and ABC and all that? No, no, just create an account. Create an account, get signed up, get your username. Username is important. Don't, I mean, it's going to be what everybody sees you. That's basically your, your screen name like it would be in a MMO or in like League of Legends. That's what everybody's going to see. So if your email address is fluffypuppy123, that's great. You can use that for your login, but your, your actual name needs to be a name that you, 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 you want everybody to see, that you want to go by. And, and we'll talk about how that looks in a minute. I know you probably know, it's like, okay, what the hell was that number beside your name um, when we were viewing the screen? Mm -hmm. Give me a second, we'll get to that. So once you get the client set up, you get it installed, you're going to pull up the game. It's going to require you to go through a tutorial, which will be not much different than what I just showed you. It'll be good to reinforce what I talked about. It has a lot of more visual aids to go with it. Um, it's all about gameplay, though. It doesn't go over deck crafting. Okay. So you're going to go through that. I think it's like five basic tutorials for each color. Um, they're not full games. I think the last one of each color is a full game. But it goes through the process. And then once you're done with all of that, it will unlock 15 starter decks for you and allow you to play against other people. So, those 15 decks are going to be a mono red, mono white, mono blue, mono black, mono green. Then it's going to be white blue, white black, blue red, blue black, white red white green red green blue green black green and black red so it's basically oh hold on i don't know if that'll be starting i've got space outdated starting decks as of november 13th okay so never mind it is, it's, i thought i just gave you guys some bad information um, okay, so you get 15 decks. Basically, you get any combination of two colors plus five mono color decks. Okay, so it'll give you used to get you used to playing with mono color, which is much easier for starting out because you have to worry about the mana composition. Make sure you play it out as you progress from there. You'll do dual colors, which is what we just looked at with the Boris Legion deck, which kind of requires you to think a little bit on how you play your mana. Um, that sort of thing. So that will get you through all of that. All right. I'm going to put a link um, as a reply to this Facebook stream. Okay. I will do that as a comment. Okay. After we're done, it's going to be a link to. Now I'll actually spell it out for you in just a second. Cardgamebase.com. Card, C-A-R-D, base, B-A-S-E. Sorry, card game base. Card, C-R-D, 
G-A-M-E-B-S-E.com. Okay. Why is that important? They have a link at the top of their page. Actually, it's usually on their homepage, too. That gives you MTG Arena codes. Now, these aren't a scam. These aren't something that gets you in trouble. This literally will give you free stuff. Okay. Now, there is an outdated... Um, yeah, there's an outdated uh, screen screenshot on there. But what it's going to do is it's going to send you to the store. Okay. It's going to tell you to go to redeem code. And then you're going to have... See, that's seven, eight. Okay, let's go back here so I'm not scrolling there too. It's going to give you eight. No, sorry. Seven codes will give you three packs of each of the sets that are in standard right now so it will give you three allegiance packs ravnica allegiance packs three guild of ravnica three war of the spark three throne of eldraine three beyond there's beyond death and three accordia packs plus three of the core set 2020 packs so you get 21 packs of cards free so please cardgamebase.com please go there once you've got set up and ready to go and get yourself an additional 168 cards, if I'm doing my math correctly. 168 cards. Just for going there and putting these codes in. Another code will give you 200, 2,000 experience, which we'll talk about in a second as well. Also, there are cards, there are codes on there, which, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, five codes that will give you a card plus the alternate art style for said card, okay? Five other codes will give you five card arts, but not necessarily the card with it. So you have to actually get the card for that card style to work. And then another code will give you two random alternate arts. So yes, please go to this, like, website, get the codes, what have you. All right. Let's say... I did all that. Cool. What now, Aaron? I've got all my packs. I've got all these you know, decks. Well, first, like I said, leave the packs alone. Leave the packs alone for now. You don't even have to open them now. If you want to, great, fine. But don't build your own deck yet. Go through, play with the starter decks. Get yourself, you know, squared away. Learn how to play. Get comfortable. Go from there. All right. So, cool. How do I play, Aaron? We're well, going to play. And what I recommend first is go through bot matches. Okay. Bot matches, you select your deck, you'll go through, you'll pick up um, Boris Legion, just like I just did, um, and play a bot match. Bot matches, you're going to have up to three dailies quests down here, and these daily quests give you coins, okay? This gives you 500 gold and 500 mastery XP if I can, can cast 20 black or green spells. Fantastic, but you set up to three, you only have one. Well, it takes 24 hours for each to reset. You have up to three. So if I don't finish this, within 14 hours, I'll have another quest. After 24 hours, if these two are still there, I'll get a third quest. And I just won't get additional quests until I've completed one. All right, so this is a good way to get gold, to get experience. Why is that important? I told you guys at the very beginning, hey, you're new, you're starting out, you don't want this big, huge curve of having to buy these cards. I remember when I played Magic before, I dumped so much money into that, but no. Excuse me. You don't have to do that here. Gold is the in-game currency that you don't have to spend actual money on. Okay? Packs. You can buy a pack of cards for a thousand gold. So you can literally keep buying packs for free. Okay? Mastery XP. 500 Mastery XP. We'll talk. Well, actually, let's talk about that in a minute when we get to, when we get to um, mastery XP and to get to playing. Okay, so I've got my coins. Great, I can get packs, but I want specific cards. How does that work? So up here, you'll see this little flower here. Okay, with the Magic: The Gathering logo in it. So as you open packs, get decks, what have you, you may have seen when I was building, when I was pulling up the Boros Legion deck. We have these diamonds above these cards, okay? You are allowed to put up to four cards into your deck with, you know, 
traditionally speaking, unless you have a card that breaks that, what have you. So why on earth would you want to have more than four copies of a card? Well, you really wouldn't. And in fact, as you played Paper Magic or Magic Gathering online, this was a big, big drawback, for, especially for common cards. Okay. For God's sakes, I've opened all these packs of cards. I've got 15 charm trees. What the hell do I do with these? Well, in paper format, you would sell them back to the store at like 10 cents a piece if you were lucky. Okay, anything ex excess of four. What Magic the Gathering Arena does is very cool. As you get additional cards that are over the max, so you get a fifth charm stray. You don't actually get the fifth charm stray. You get progress towards what they call a wild card. All right. So these wild cards, and, and, and I, I can't actually show you what it looks like. You have to do it when you open a pack, I think. Um, oh, here they are up here. Okay. So these wild cards will allow you to craft any card you want. Okay. So commons, I think it takes... Is it six commons? I know it's six uncommons and six rares you get additional um if you get additional wild cards or additional wild card pieces or progress towards it you finally flip to a wild card so let's say i want a and now that was very convoluted i'm sorry i'm trying to make sure i make this as, as easy as possible for you let's say you want a 